Uh, once again, good morning to each and every one of you. I see that for us, so those in Zoom, over Zoom, there's one or two uh, new faces. Uh, welcome to Maggie and I see Carl. Uh, it's good to have you guys. Um, and I hope that as we continue in the service, looking at this reality, that our King no longer is in the grave. Christ is risen. Okay, we'll try that one more time. And I hope you Zoomers are also loud enough wherever you are. Christ is risen. There we go. That's much better. And we are really celebrating this. Uh, later on, uh, Jared will give us uh, the word from God as he preaches and proclaims and explains what it means that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. My hope and prayer is that we will know that hope that Jesus gives. I'm going to spend some time just praying for a number of things. I'm going to be praying for those who may not be well. I'm going to be praying for those who may be traveling, including uh, uh, Tim and I. Uh, after this service, we are going to be heading out of here. The car is packed. And so I'm not talking to anybody after the service. I'm just rushing for the door. I'm talking. I'm going to have coffee and then I'm going to leave. But I'm going to pray for those traveling during this Easter time, whether you're going somewhere, you're coming from somewhere. Um, and I'm just going to pray that God will prepare our hearts for his word this morning. So let us bow our heads and let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are God who reigns. We thank you that you are God who gives life. Father, we pray this morning that this uh, fact may not just be words that we say that Christ is risen, but Rather, that it may give us a hope to live by. That we would understand that your life, your conquering of the death, is a great promise for us. That in this life, in this time, we don't need to be afraid. Because you have conquered all of our enemies. And we know that there is that promise for us. But I also want to pray this morning for those traveling to and from different places i pray that you would keep them safe that this reality may hit in their hearts and cause them to ponder and worship and reflect and praise i pray that the meaning of the resurrection may be more than just words to us father i pray for those of us who are not well in any way I pray that they may know the power, the resurrection power, the power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, that you would strengthen their bodies and that they would continue to look to you, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Father, I pray that as your word will be proclaimed to us this morning, that you would open our hearts and help us to hear you, help us to believe and help us to live in a way that is worthy of the calling we've received. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, it's just sweating bullets up in here. Um, so here's some just um, church family news for us just to be aware of what's happening. So next week, Sunday, the 11th of April, there won't be a service here at the Student Y. That's because we are having Jesus Sunday. Now, Jesus Sunday is a means to help us have church in smaller groups in people's homes. It is also a, a means by which we can be encouraged to invite others, perhaps people who are not used to the idea of church. Um, and so we've, we've tried to make sure that that is a, 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 a repeated idea amongst us throughout the year. Every couple of weeks, we'll be having Jesus Sundays where we won't be meeting here, um, where we'll just be hearing from God's word in smaller groups over perhaps coffee or lunch or whatever it is, provided we adhere to all the regulations that have been given. So that's happening next Sunday. So don't come to the hall at half past nine because you won't find anybody here. Then the following Sunday, the 18th of April, we'll be having our second evangelistic talk. We've, this year we've uh, set aside that every six weeks, We'll have a guest preacher come to help us, encourage us about how to live missionally and evangelistically. So Sunday, the 18th of April, we'll have 
Uh, Steve Rockwell was a lecturer at George Whitfield Bible, uh, George Whitfield Bible College. And he will be helping us understand his, his title for his talk will be Why Jesus Hates Religion um, or Jesus Hates Religion. So bring your friends to that. It's an idea to bring people who, who perhaps are not sure about the Christian faith and who want to hear a little bit more. Um, and so he will be tackling that subject and there will be opportunities just to engage with him afterwards. So invite your friends, that's Sunday the 18th of April. As I said, uh, I'll be away for two weeks, so please don't text me. Um, please don't email me. There are elders in the church. There's Jared at the back there. Uh, my temptation is if you SMS me or email me, I want to answer. So help me not do that on my holiday. So that is, um, we leave today, we come back on the 17th. So out of the office means out of the office. So let's not be texting sense because Tim might take my phone and uh, I might not see it anymore. So um, those are the church family news. Um, I want to pray for the kids as Daniela helps uh, and teach uh, the young ones as they continue looking at the Easter Sunday theme. And we pray that as they listen to the words of God being taught in whatever form and activities that they do, that God would speak and reveal himself to them. So let me pray for Daniela and the kids. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are Lord God, who has revealed himself, who keeps revealing himself. We thank you that also you reveal yourself to children. We thank you for the ministry to children here at the message. We give thanks for the dedication that is put in, in, in teaching and in walking with the children and in teaching them Jesus. Father, we pray this morning for Daniela as she helps, as she teaches, that you would be merciful and kind and reveal yourself to the children as they learn about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps as the kids leave, we can actually then stand and worship one more time before I read God's word to us. See what a morning. It's a well-known song. Um, it, the words are reflecting on this particular day. See what a morning that this is.
I'm going to be reading to us now as a general will come and preach God's word to us, explaining uh, that Christ is risen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. But if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then it is coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is expected who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the son, the son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him. A lot of subjections. That God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts in Ephesus if the dead are not raised? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as, it, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body 
that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body he has chosen, and to each kind of seed, its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural. And then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was well the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have been, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Yeah, amen. A uh, warm welcome to you on this Easter Sunday. If you're a Zoomer and have logged in on Zoom, a warm welcome to you. My name is Jared. I'm one of the pastors here at the Message Church. It's great that you can be with us on this Easter. Let me set this up. Um, if you have a Bible, keep it open. We're going to keep our noses in that text. Uh, thank you to Sands for reading a rather long passage. Um, That's what yeah. Thank you. All right. If you are a visitor, we hope to give you a welcome pack. Just to tell you a little bit about the message. I know Takuta has joined us. Thanks for coming, brother. Um, there is a welcome pack at the back. We'll share it with you. Do stay behind for some hot cross buns and some coffee. Those of you who are here, as I um, as I stood at the back and as Sands uh, said, Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen indeed. I I was moved. I was yeah. I thought about that. I I, I was encouraged. I rejoiced that they are brothers and sisters that we can link arms and say that Jesus is risen. To be able to say a statement like that is truly a, a gift from God. I'm well aware of that this Easter. It is a genuine grace and a genuine mercy. You see, to respond to a statement like that or to affirm a statement like that is to pledge allegiance. It's to pledge allegiance to Jesus of Nazareth. The ancient uh, Catholic and universal church has said, I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born by the Virgin Mary, he suffered unto Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. No small confession for us to say that this morning. It's no, it's, it is no small thing to say that a man rose from the dead. That is a statement about ultimate reality. I hope you believe it. Because making a statement like that is vastly at odds in our modern world. To, to assert that this Jesus, this Jewish peasant, was the Son of God, that he was the Jewish Messiah, that he was crucified, that he died, and on three days later, he rose in power from the dead. It is pretty ludicrous. People will scoff at you and will look at you in all sorts of ways. But there's nothing new under the sun, um, as we scoff at a point, as those who scoff at a risen Messiah, the church in Corinth started with, uh, struggled with this reality too. Have a look at verse 12, and that is kind of the, the background to this chapter, one of the things that Paul is dealing with in this letter. He says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? The church in Corinth struggled with it, as do the modern world. There's nothing new under the sun. This is what they struggled with. Can a man rise from the dead? But if there's no resurrection, there's no gospel, and there's no church. Interestingly, the BBC ran a survey I was reading the other night um, in 2017, and it claimed that a quarter of the people that said they were Christians or described themselves as a Christian do not believe in the literal resurrection of Jesus. And so Paul's letter is a rebuttal to them. It's a challenge to us. It's to help us. And I, I pray that that's what it would do. I think God has preserved this. He has kept this Paul's testimony for us here, Easter 2021, in the middle of a global pandemic. So I hope that this passage will give you that grace and mercy. You would continue to say, Jesus is risen. The first thing I really want to say is the gospel is historically reliable. Um, I don't know if you know Christopher Hitchens. Uh, he's written a popular book. He's an atheist. How religion poisons everything. Anyway, in there he makes a statement. He says, what can be asserted without evidence can also be dismissed without evidence. What can be asserted with the evidence can be dismissed without evidence. Hitchens is making the argument that you and me who make this claim that Jesus is risen is that we say it without any evidence. We just merely assert it and hope, and hope for the best. But the question is, is Hitchens right? Is there no evidence for the claims of the gospel and the resurrection? Paul here testifies that there is. Let's have a look. Let's see what he says. Let's look at verses 1 to 4. I'm not going to go through the whole passage. Um, but in verses 1 to 4, Paul tells us what the Christian gospel is. The word gospel simply means good news. So Paul is saying to the, um, to the Corinthians, remember the gospel. Look at verse 1. Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Those first four verses, Paul is giving us the content of the gospel. And in short, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus being sent by the Father and this great love that they have between them. The Father sends the Son to die for the sins of the whole world. It's about his burial and about his resurrection on the third day, according to the scriptures. And it's about him being enthroned as the Lord and King of all the universe. So Paul says to the Corinthians, the gospel that you received, that you are saved by, and that you are standing firm in. 
But there's a key aspect of the gospel there, and that is the resurrection from the dead. And Paul's point is there is no gospel without the resurrection of Jesus. There is no good news. There is, and therefore, there is no Christianity. You see, belief in the resurrection is not some additional extra thing, some extra spice. I thought about the, the tick that you have when you go to Mr. Delivery um, and you tick extra spice you know, from KFC. It's not an additional extra. We can't claim to be Christians or Christ followers if we don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Paul says our preaching and our faith is in vain. We're still in our sins if this is the case. So again, as we make that declaration, I'm well aware that it is the grace and the mercy of God that we can make a claim like that. I pray that we would have faith and continue to believe it and trust it and, and believe its historical nature. So Paul says, I, I, it was passed on to me and I delivered it to you. I think it's verse 3. So Paul, in other words, is saying, I didn't make this up. The language of received and passed indicates that he was relaying something, an oral tradition, before it became written. So we must ask, who did he receive it from and who did he pass it on to? Well, the passing it on is the easy part. He passed it on to the Corinthians. Paul planted the church there. He went and he reasoned with first the Jews and then the rest of the uh, Gentiles about Jesus. But who did he receive it from? And I think he tells us here in verse 4 and 5, particularly one aspect of the gospel. Um, he says, Jesus rose, arose on the third day in verse 4. In verse 5, he says, Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to Cephas, which is another name for the apostle Peter and the other 12 disciples. He appeared to 500 brothers, most of whom are still alive. Then he appeared to James and to the apostles in verse 7. And lastly, he appeared to me, referencing his Damascus road experience. The risen Lord appeared to, to him there. So let's state the claim clearly that Paul is making this morning. Paul is saying that the gospel of Jesus is about the resurrection. There's no gospel. There's no Christianity without the resurrection. A gospel he received, not invented. We, we, he didn't create it. A gospel that is witnessed by the apostles. And he names two people, James and John, right? Two eyewitnesses who have become the leaders of the church in Jerusalem and five other hundred people that are still alive. And he says some have fallen asleep, which means some have, some have died. But some are, are still alive. So the implication is that if anyone doubts what he is saying, what the Apostle Paul is saying, if anyone in the church of Corinth, that's who the letter was written to, if you are skeptical, if you are doubting the bodily resurrection of Jesus, in one way you could check the facts, right? Those eyewitnesses are still alive. Leave Corinth. Travel to Jerusalem, right? And you can inquire with James and Peter. You can ask the 500 eyewitnesses that are there. Some have fallen asleep. So if scholars say that this was written mid-50s, um, we say Jesus was crucified AD 30, 33. So 20 years, Paul has gone proclaiming the gospel. He persecuted the church first. He then proclaimed the gospel. Um, but it's, it's 20 years later, and he's saying, go and inquire for yourself. So contrary to what Hitchens may say, we are not merely just asserting Jesus rose from the dead. Here is clear evidence. Now, you're probably sitting there, I get it, you're probably sitting there and saying, hey, this is a little bit circular. You're arguing for the resurrection from the Bible, right? Is it not a proper Gander document? Could it not have been written up by the early disciples. The German scholar Boltman said, no, the, the disciples wanted to carry on the, the, the legacy and the memory of Jesus, so they fabricated him into a risen from the dead. He actually didn't. Um, but is that the case? Well, I wanna, I, wanna make a, I wanna think about that claim for a moment, if maybe that is something that you struggle with. I think there are really just two options for us to consider if we think that the Bible is propaganda. The first one is, Paul then is a deceiver, right? He writes this letter. Maybe he lied, he fabricated the letter, and his testimony um, is false. And he, he kind of made Jesus rise from the dead in his letters. The other option is that what Paul received was mistaken. He was deceived by the people who passed it on to him, the disciples. 
So let's think about that for a second. Let's think about, the first point I really want to think about is, well, what is the Bible? Right? What is this? This book that I have here. What is it? Well, it's firstly, it's a collection of writings, right? Someone didn't sit down, I'll use Will in his example. Will didn't sit down and God told him everything he should say and he wrote it all down at once. We believe that the, the Bible is a collection of writings from the apostles, not all written at the same time and not all written at once. Yes, thankfully, God in his sovereignty now, we can stand and we can have a full Bible. But that wasn't always the case. The early church didn't have the New Testament. They would have had the Old Testament, but they wouldn't have had the New Testament. They would have had the writings of Paul, the writings of the disciples, but they wouldn't have had them all in one place like we do. Another thing to remember is the church now, we don't even have the original autographs. Meaning we don't even have the original manuscripts. We don't have them. I think God in his sovereignty, I think, I think we would probably would have worshipped them if we did. But we don't have them. And all we have is copies of these documents. We have them in museums and, li and libraries. We've got hundreds of, of copies from various regions. And these are called codexes. Um, and they, they're they basically either um, writings of the New Testament, a few of the books, or the New Testament in, in its entirety. But they're, they're various codexes from the Greco-Roman world, some from the Byzantine Empire, some from Ethiopia. Anyway, so scholars have these codexes, these New Testament documents that originated from different areas, firstly, not from the same areas, different areas written at various times. There was a great discovery called the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, that were discovered, I think, 80, probably a uh, hundred years ago. Um, 19? 40s or 50s. So what is that? 60 years ago. <laughs> no, no, definitely not 100. Thank you. Thank you for paying attention. Anyway, the Dead Sea Scrolls are a tradition of, 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 of there's some writings of the Old Testament and uh, there's some New Testament documents. But the point is, when they found these documents, there's a field of study called textual criticism. And that happens not just with biblical scholarship, but all types of scholarship. When they find old documents, they, they, they evaluate them, right? So you have manuscripts from one tradition, from one area of the world, manuscripts from another area. Textual critics bring them together and have a look and say, well, this is a manuscript from 500 years ago. This is a manuscript from 1,000 years ago. Are they similar? And often they are. And those differences are minute. Maybe a scribe had too much wine that night and an L became an R or something like that. Um, but the point that I'm trying to make here is we don't have the original documents. What we have are copies. So the early church, Paul wrote his letter. He sent it to Corinth. The church realized that this is an authoritative letter, copied it down and circulated it. Uh, Peter's um, later, he write to the church in the dispersion, meaning that it was expected his letter would be copied and sent round, right? And so the church has got copies. We don't have the original autographs. And now the question that I'm really wanting us to think about this morning is, would you copy, would you copy a lie? Would you copy a propaganda document if the apostles and Paul, if they were propaganda documents? Would you copy it? Not only that, then, would you copy a document that makes a specific claim, right? Paul sends it out in the 50s. He writes, there are 500 men in Jerusalem. Some have fallen asleep. Okay, there's 100. There are 100 men in Jerusalem and two apostles that are head of the church, and I named them. Would you copy a document if it were a lie, if it were a propaganda document? You could easily go and verify it at the time. But the early church copied it. They wrote it down and they circulated it. Because they weren't believing in a myth. They had testified to the power of God. You see, you and I may circulate something for money, for power and for control. Propaganda documents, that's what the point is, right? To elicit those three things. To control the population, to make a huge sum of money. That is understandable. But that is the exact opposite of what Christians had. They had no power, they had no money, and they had no control. 
in the first century. They were persecuted and killed for their faith. Would you die for a lie? Would you lose your job for a lie? Sands on Friday spoke about Josephus, a Jewish historian. He's not a Christian. Um, there's another historian, a Roman historian, but a senator. I don't know if I'm saying his name right. His name is Tacitus. Anyway, this is a non-Christian source, right? From the first century. You can Google this name and you can go check it out on the internet. He writes about the early Christians. In particular, he writes during the, the reign of Nero. Nero was a Roman emperor. He persecuted the church in AD 60. Um, so 30 years later, he writes about the torture of Christians in Rome. Let me read what he says. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished. Or were nailed to crosses or were doomed to the flames it burnt to serve as nightly illumination. When daylight had expired, Nero offered his gardens for a spectacle and was exhibiting a show in the circus when he mingled with the people in the dress of a charita or stood aloft on a car. Hence, even for criminals who deserved extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion. For it was not as it seemed for a public good, but to glut one man's cruelty, they were being destroyed. So here's a non-Christian source that testifies to what was happening to Christians. Peter, we think, is writing in a similar time. Christians were being dipped in tar and put into Nero's gardens as, as light. Here's a non-Christian source that talks about what happened to the Christians. There was a great fire that broke out in Rome and he, Nero, the emperor, blamed the Christians. He used them as a scapegoat. I'll come back to that question. Would you copy a propaganda document, a lie? Would you circulate it if you could be dipped in time and set alight? I think this argument extends both to Paul's testimony and to the first apostles. I'm going to read a little bit of a book. But why would they die and, and suffer persecution if they were delusional, if they made this up? Again, you might do it for power, for influence, right? There are great teachers that do that, that, that deceive people for, for money and power. But there won't be great, many great teachers that will do it and when persecuted or caught out, would continue. Yet this is the exact opposite of the disciples, right? Particularly the Apostle Paul. I'm going to read a little bit of a book. Um, it's called the, the King of God's Kingdom, A Solution to the Puzzle of Jesus by David Seckham, who was the principal of the um, Bible college that I attended. Anyway, he, he's, he's, he's giving evidence for the resurrection. And here he talks about Paul, the Apostle Paul. So it's quite important for us to remember who Paul was and think about him in light of this. Let me read some of it to you. The heading is Unique Qualifications. It's on page 25. I know some of you will have the book. Paul was unique in early Christianity. He was a student of Gamaliel, the first, the leading rabbi of his day. In Jewish tradition, there's a chain of succession of great rabbis, leading from Ezra through to Hillel, to Shammai, and to, to Gamaliel the first. Sorry, I can't pronounce that very well. And on to the second century. If he had not become a follower of Jesus, Paul might have well been part of this succession. Indeed, if the intellect he displays in his letters and the energy he gave to the mission are anything to go by, Saul of Tarsus, that was his name before Paul, would probably be ranked by the Jews today of one of the great rabbis. Do you understand the argument? That Paul studied under this great rabbi. This great rabbi that was well known. And if he continued in that track, he might have become a great rabbi like the ones that are mentioned here. Second goes on to say, as a Christian, he was qualified to be the expert witness, able to give authoritative judgment on the question of whether Christianity presented a departure from the historic path of Moses and the prophets. His judgment was that there was a clear line of continuity from Abraham and Moses to the resurrection of the Messiah, Jesus. It was all part of God's ongoing action to save the world. He goes on to talk a little bit, then he says at the end, he carried his testimony consistent to the end and sealed it with his blood, executed according to tradition during the latter part of the reign of Nero. Nero persecuted the Christians during this time. So Paul the argument is, why would Paul give up all that he had, right? All that he had or could have been to 
circulate to reach Christians and Gentiles for the gospel if it were a lie. To say that Jesus was Lord was in direct opposition to Nero. He was seen as Lord. Yet Christians believed that Jesus was Lord and that he resurrected from the dead. Let's think of a modern example. In our culture, let's use the issue of racism. If someone says you're a racist, what immediately happens? If they prove it or record you, you get canceled. You, you get deplatformed. You get thrown out. You may even get fired. This happens in Christian circles. Sadly, we've heard of the revelation of Rabbi Zacharias. But since then, the fallout, donors stop. People want to tear up his books, delete his podcast, his sermons. And he's taken off immediately. Why do we think that that wouldn't happen to the Apostle Paul and the disciples if this was a lie? Instead, we've got hundreds of copies of New Testament documents circulated for us so that we could stand with a full testimony, with the full word of God preserved for us in God's sovereignty. Listen to the Apostle John. That which was from the beginning which we heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen, which we have heard and which we proclaim. Would a man that was imprisoned on an island write that if it were false? And that's why Paul says our preaching is vain. Our faith is in vain. We are misrepresenting God if Jesus did not rise from the dead. That is the confidence he wants us to have and to stand in today. And there's a blessing for us. In John 20, one of the disciples um, hasn't seen Jesus yet. Thomas, doubting Thomas, has become known as. He's like, unless I see the holes, unless I see the scars, unless I touch a side where he was pierced, I won't believe. Jesus comes, he stands among them, he says, peace be with you. And he says to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, put out your hand, place it on my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. That's a testimony, my Lord, in direct opposition to Nero, my God. Then Jesus says to him, as he says to us, if you have believed because you have seen me, But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's why I said it is a grace of God for us to say Jesus is risen from the dead. And so my hope is that this Easter you'd be strengthened in that belief, that you would hold it, that you would stand in it, that you would believe it to the end. But my hope is also that the, um, the belief and the testimony of the resurrected Jesus would give you hope. And this is just my last point. Would give you hope, but would give you hope for a resurrected body. And that's what this passage is also about. And so this East, in the midst of a global pandemic and a a pandemic that is attacking our bodies, I pray that we would have hope in our future bodies. We don't often talk about it, but I think it's important. I know that there are, in fact, people in this congregation that have battled the stroke, that have battled cancer, that are battling cancer, that live in the shadow of various diseases, that have struggled with uh, chronic back pain, knee pain, that has limited their capacity and their ability. I'm well aware there are chemical imbalances, physiological and mental health issues that we struggle with. We live in a world that is compromised. Our bodies are compromised and dying. Our culture is well aware of this brokenness. Um, We spend millions trying to cover up the effects of it. Um, We spend millions trying to hide aging. We spend millions in insurance trying to avoid the death, the loss of life. And this is all because of sin. That's what Easter is about. It's a story about sin that has fractured our world, fractured our relationships, and fractured the planet. And our bodies that are part of that. We are compromised. But the gospel is good news. The gospel is news about Jesus who rose from the dead and who became a guarantee for you and me who hold to that truth of what would come. Let me read verses 13 to 23. Have a look if you have your Bible open. 
Paul says, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Whereas by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Whereas in Adam all died, so, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits then, that is coming those who belong to Jesus. Paul is saying to us this morning that Jesus is the first fruit of the harvest that is to come. He is the guarantee of the future. You see, the first fruits of the harvest, the pickings of the crop. And this bring encouragement to the farmer. They tell him there is a harvest that is about to happen. And that is what the resurrection of Jesus is for us. It's not just Jesus overcoming sin, Satan, and death. And that is indeed, firstly and foremost, what he does. But that's a guarantee for us. That is a guarantee for you and me this morning. That we will have a resurrected body. And so my prayer, my hope this Easter as we reflect would be what Paul says here from verse 15. Let me read a little bit more of it to you. I tell you, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does perishable inherit the imperishable. Basically what Paul means is our earthly bodies can't inherit the kingdom of God. And so God has to do something new. He has to recreate us. And so there is hope for us. God must replace them. And then he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this, imperishable, this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. But when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, death, the greatest enemy is overcome. Where is your victory? Where is your sting? For many centuries you have taunted people. You have caused them to live in fear of you. Paul is telling us that the, the sting in the tail is gone. It's been disarmed. It's been destroyed. It's been swallowed up in victory. Jesus has conquered death from rising from the dead on the third day. One evangelist, uh, David Watson, illustrated this verse by telling the story of his daughter um, that called out to him in a garden. Um, she was being chased and terrified by bees all over the place. And so instinctively, in his fatherly love, he wrapped his arms around her and embraced her in this protective care. And moments later, his, his daughter felt his body was tense. And then he let her go, saying, You don't need to worry now, my darling. The bee has stung me, and bees do not sting twice. And in demonstration of his deep love for us this morning, God has sent his son, his one and only son, his beloved Jesus, who has wrapped himself around us, who has died on the cross in our place and on our behalf for our sins. And he has taken the sting of death. There is no condemnation and no punishment for us this Easter morning. We can rejoice that we will have resurrected bodies. So thanks be to God who gives us the victory. And my prayer in closing is this. That if you haven't placed your faith in Jesus, that if you haven't trusted in the resurrected Messiah, that you would inquire, that you would seek, that you would prod, that you would poke at Christianity, that you would ask tough, tough questions. Because Christians are making a claim to ultimate reality. Secondly, as this passage makes a claim about the resurrected Messiah, I pray that we would know that there is no gospel without this, that there is no truth, that there is no hope, 
And so for you and I, that have put our faith in Jesus, that we would continue in it. As Paul says here, I encourage you this Easter, he says it, I need to say it, stand firm. Hold on, immovable, confident, but not just inactive, but abounding in the work of the Lord. Stand firm in the resurrected truth this Easter. Continue to believe it, even when you are mocked and scorned. Don't waste your life this Easter. Jesus says you can gain the whole world and yet you can forfeit your soul. And so I pray that as each of us at different stages really are actually just dying, that we would die well. That we would make radical decisions for Jesus, knowing the hope that we have this Easter. So that is my prayer for us. Let me pray and let me commit us to God this Easter. Father, thank you for the gospel that was delivered of first importance. That Christ died for our sins, for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to people. Thank you for that gospel in which we stand, in which we are saved, in which we pledge allegiance to help us to believe it. Thank you that it is an ultimate grace that we can actually say Jesus is risen from the dead. Help us as a church community to believe it, to live out that reality. And Father, I pray for those who may be skeptical, may have doubt. That is okay. I pray that you would reveal yourself to them, that they would, they would seek you in the truth of the claims that are made. So bless us this Easter, we pray and guide and protect us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just as you are in that prayerful spirit, let's continue to pray. Father, may your words change our lives. May the message of your resurrection encourage us. May you cause us to live with boldness, never being afraid because death is defeated. Christ Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and worship one more time. That same, uh, the final song we sang, uh, uh, See What a Morning. Um, let me encourage us to really let the words come out. This is a beautiful day. This is a great morning. Zoomers, it's been good. Um, Gathering with you, I always feel like I'm not looking at you, though I hope I am looking at you. So there we go. It's good that uh, you worship with us. Let us stand and worship, see what a morning, and then we'll enjoy some hot cross buns and coffee uh, outside. Mm -hmm.